Hello and welcome to this edition of Velocity Kinetics. Um, this is a bit weird because I'm recording this after I've filmed everything. Because the original introduction I filmed, it, it was quite annoying. Uh, the video was out of sync. Audio hardly recorded at all. What did record, like I said, was massively out of sync. And the frame rate dropped monstrously, unbeknownst to me. So, I've now got to try and recapture what we're talking about. So, what are we talking about? Well, what we're talking about this time, we're looking at different alternatives to get the car fueled. And what we do we mean by that? Well, I know we've already done the f a video on this channel before. It was a driving video, driving around uh, Newcastle, um, talking about the future of the car. Now, with the British government announcing they're bringing forwards the sale of electric-only vehicles, to, until to the year 2030 it was previously the year 2040 then they brought it forward to the year 2035 and now it's the year 2030 it, it's gotten me thinking actually is electric really the way to go there are a lot of holes in their idea and it's less than perfect really in so many aspects and we'll go through those now as well as discussing the alternatives i forgot to mention that too But before we go into that, I want to catch up on Elvis's video from Monday because I haven't had a chance to catch up on it. Video not used with Elvis's permission. So, it's a bit later in the day than I'd originally planned to uh, to do uh, some more of this recording, but nonetheless, get on. Let's get on with it now. Just a quick warning: there are some flashing lights that you might see. Anyone with epilepsy, skip a horde about a horde forward about ten seconds. Christmas tree. <laughs> so, first up, electric. That's the way the country is seemingly wanting to go with fuel. Well, not just fuel, but that's the way they're seemingly just wanting to go with the way cars are uh, powered. Now, the UK government has brought forward plans from, from 2040 to 2035 to their now 2030 of when they're going to ban the sale of combustion vehicles and only permit the sale of electric. Now, that's optimistic for my liking, especially with, with what's happened with COVID. If we hadn't had COVID, then it might be a bit more feasible. But at the moment, it just really is not doable in my eyes. But what's the main plus point of electric? Well, main plus point, no emissions, instant, instant power, instant torque, Cheap to refuel, as in cheap to charge up, especially if you'd use your own electricity overnight. Shouldn't, in theory, for most journeys, worry need to worry too much about range anxiety, because you'll get into a habit of plugging in overnight, or at least that's what we'd hope. We'd hope so. In theory, maintenance goes down because of um, electric engines being a lot more simpler, a lot more simple than traditional combustion. They will be able to change the design of cars. Potentially more storage space. Because um, you won't have to have a traditional spot in the front for a mo the full-blown motor like you have with a petrol. Other plus points that you don't think of. Um, unless you're fortunate enough to have something particularly afford that will have this. A heated front windscreen. Um, which is brilliant in the winter for when the car starts steaming up or, whether, or when it's frosty. With that... Unless you happen to be driving a car like, I say, like a Ford or something like that. A lot of manufacturers have got their own versions these days. But it's not up and down all the range. For instance, on my Suzuki, I can't get one. And from what I've looked at in all the brochures, you can't get one. So aside from maybe on the Swayze. So for those of us who don't have that luxury, we've got to sit and wait for the car to warm up. With an electric motor, there's no need to wait for the engine to warm up. That sort of thing will happen immediately, so you won't need to wait for the thermostats to and, and temperature gauges to come to come on. Other plus points, you'll be able to potentially start the car up from inside uh, via an app. I know Volvo can do that. I saw an advert, and I think I might have shared it on this page a few years ago. That Volvo, I think it was Volvo Select or Volt, no, Select, they use Division. can't remember what it, what it was, but it was something Volvo. Um, it was demonstrated on the XC60. Um, 
but you'd just be able to start the car up from the side, and then away you go. So those are some plus points on electric. Sorry, the jump edit there, because uh, I had a brain fart whilst recording, and I thought I'd gone wrong. But those are some plus points on going electric. Some downsides of going electric. Range anxiety. The charging network isn't up to par. And some people are going to struggle to even be able to charge their vehicles. Which uh, some people might say, well, it's under the charging network. No, I'm not meaning charging network as in how you can charge your car at home. I'm just referring to if you're out and about and need to top up, then the ability to do so. Uh, Mark Priestley in a couple of videos when he's had electric cars, he's talked about difficulties getting enough electric to uh, from from fast chargers out and about. Um, when he's done long journeys in them, there was an article granted. As far as I'm concerned, it was a money grabbing headliner. Oh, woe well, is me! I want my twenty minutes, and I'm a I'm a ten grand for my story. Kind of stories where someone had got a new Porsche Taycan, and it, a journey took them eight hours. A journey that would normally have taken them about two in a car, in a petrol or diesel car, but because the the car was running low on electric and they'd miscalculated, it took them forever to get the car charged. So that side of things is not good. Charge time at the moment is not good. Whilst you can do fast charge, the trade of is a fast charge at the moment will obviously have a few more years of development and this should hopefully improve. But at the moment, fast charge, I could fill my car up probably three or four times, in, at least in the same time of a fast charge. The other thing as well is you're more conscious about using all the features in the car, so on a hot day be more conscious about using your aircon. You'll be more conscious about using your heated windows in the, in the summer. Not summer, in the winter. If you're using the heated windows in the summer, then yeah, it's probably summer in England. Um, but that is a problem, and, partic and one major problem at the moment, at least for me, it's the sheer cost of an electric vehicle at the moment. At the moment in the UK, if you want to buy an electric vehicle, the cost is through the roof. You want a Volkswagen, I think it's the Volkswagen ID. You're looking for the same price as something that's about the size of a VW Golf. I could have something the size of a BMW 5 Series, a Volvo V90, certainly at least a V60. I could have a huge car, I could have a Subaru Levorg. And the Levorg is an enormous vehicle for that same cost. It's absolutely nuts. There's no... With electric vehicles, for the most part, there's no cheap version of them. So say, for instance, you want a cheap... You want a little Super Mini to get from work and home. You don't care about what options it's got on it. You just want something that... Fire up, brum brum, beep beep, park. And then reverse the process, beep beep, brum brum, I'm home. That's all you want for, from that car. There are hordes of options... Hordes and hordes, all the way from, from Alpha to Volkswagen. If you really want to splash out, then I guess you could include Volvo. But certainly from Alpha to Volkswagen, there are lots and lots of pretty cheap options. The Polo, the Mito, the Seat Ibiza, the Skoda Fabia. Well, I guess you could also include the, Beam, the, the Beamer 1 series and the Audi 8 1. A push, They're quite expensive. Fiat 500 is quite popular, maybe even the Fiat Tipo, Ford Fiesta is a classic, Suzuki Swift, uh, Smart, 4.4, 4.2, you know, the list goes on and on and on for those cars. And if you just need an entry-level model, that's it. Don't care about having sat-nav, if you don't care about having reversing cameras, parking sensors, you name it. There are lots and lots of cheap options, particularly in the Japanese market, is it not as in that they, they're cheap, or st cheap and stingy, it's just something that they're very good at compared to the rest of the world. But if you want an electric car, that they're crammed full of tech. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. But it drives the cost up. It's really quite astounding as to how we deem it to be acceptable. Um, not that it should be unacceptable, you know what I mean. It's like, how can that be acceptable that you can only buy... If you want, my, for instance, my brother wants to get, an, get a car, he'd like something electric. The cheapest car I can think of, without if he wants to go brand new, that's electric. The only cheapest one I can think of is a Renault Zoe, which isn't necessarily a bad car. 
It's just quite expensive and you could have a pretty good Clio or an even better Megane for the same sort of money. You know, what? what is what is the point? In theory, in time, that will come down, that price. But the fact that they haven't very much, and Tesla have been around a good good number of years now, Polestar have been around a couple of years as well. Gen in general, electrification has been on the go for years. E even if you include going hybrid, the Toyota did it years ago with the Prius. I want to say 2004, 2005... Somewhere between 2003 and 2005, without looking it up, and I'll have a look. I'll look it up in a minute. Somewhere around there, when they started with the Prius, go and doing that. So electrification has been coming. My cons other concern, though, with electric, at least in this for this dose of thought, internet in the UK. I can't speak for anywhere else, but internet in the UK is very spotty. We have some fantastic, some places that have fantastic internet connections that you wouldn't think would. So, for instance, when I lived in Middlesbrough, we had some fantastically fast fibre optic broadband, and I've lived in the country as well, in the countryside. And at one point, the village I lived in, the dial-up speed was faster than broadband, and broadband had been around about four or five years by then. So, four or five years into broadband's life, dial-up was still faster in some places in the UK. Some people struggle to get two megabits a second. And not even just from having fibre optic or anything like that. They just can't get it. And the network infrastructure upgrades that are needed is insane. Now unless a lot of these manufacturers are going to provide decent cloud services or what have you. For the cars to get updates. Because for instance cars like Tesla get their updates OTA over the air. And I imagine BMW iCars do the same. I imagine the Polestar would do the same. They get the updates OTA and then carry on. It saves you having to go into the garage as long as the update installs as as it should. However, if it's an important safety update and you live somewhere where it's still stuck on 2 megabits a second, these file packets, OTAs, are going to be quite large, I would have thought, for the amount of data needed for a car. I'd be amazed if they are sub a gigabyte. I imagine they'll be four, five, six gigabytes a time for the amount of data involved. Now, if I'm wrong, and it's only a couple, couple of hundred megs, that's not too bad, but still on, two, on, on places where on two, three, four, five megabits a second, that is an age. And if it's an important, important update for the car, you've got a car that's potentially, depending on the nature of the update, may not be safe enough to drive, or at least may not be as good as it could be. And then we come back around to that point I mentioned a few minutes ago. Again, with the UK not having very good internet, a lot of places won't be able to get good ability to charge their cars. For instance, there are a couple of streets where we used to live in South Shields. When you look at the houses, you think they're, they're what, two up, one down houses. So you think they're two bedroom, one reception room houses with street parking. But most of the street's been split into flats. Most of the street up and down that it's a upstairs flat and a downstairs flat. And there's only so many places you can park, and there's only so many places you can charge. And I don't think people want to be running extension cords in and out of their house. Whilst it's electric cable doesn't stop some dickhead trying to cut it. I asked Mark Priestley on, a, on one of his F1 Elvis videos about uh, can't someone just pull the plug out, but apparently, at least on the leaf he had, if I remember the response he said correctly, he said plug it in and then it gets locked in place with the key, I think he said, something like that. So actually you couldn't just walk along and unplug it, which is a small crumb of comfort. But the other issue is, like, for instance, where I am now, the house, this cottage we live in now, is a grade two listed cottage built in the mid-16th century. No, 16th century? 1600s, I beg your pardon. 1600s, we think it was built about 1650, that's as close as we can get because a lot of the information is missing out of the deeds, apparently, and conf gives conflicting information. I'd be amazed if I'd be permitted to install, not ignoring my, need my landlord's permission, I'd be amazed if I'd be permitted to stall somewhere to plug in an electric car to charge it, because it's of it being grade 2 listed. I also have listed trees in the garden, so it's not like a case of, well, we'll just move one of those trees, we'll just uproot it, I'm completely stuck. 
So I'd have to run a cable from my living room, assuming that it isn't, all, particularly in winter where it's already pretty bloody cold, I have to run a cable from the living room out to the garden. And the reason I say out to the garden, whilst the driveway is there, it's wide enough for one car. And my landlord's garages are over there. So I have to go in and around. I, my, I basically do a U shape to get in and out. And I'll probably do a video of that tomorrow. Just to for, for, for something else I've got in mind. But it, 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 it it's nuts for some people that you'll be, you know, you won't be able to charge the sodding vehicle, potentially. And then, like I said, if you want to take advantage of doing it cheap and overnight, so I've got to come to an arrangement to do it one by one. You've got to ha either have the plugs installed on the front of your house, which again, if you've got not got a very long driveway, that is precious space if you've got a big car. If you've got a big car. So if you've got big, big Volvo Estate, big SUV, shitty thing. Um, you know, it's not the most straightforward of things. It's going to potentially lead to a lot more illegal parking. It's going to lead to a lot of dangerous practices. The government in the UK are prattling on about doing it. But at the moment they have no real tangible way of demonstrating how they're going to accommodate it. It's food for thought. One problem with the electric car that no one likes to talk about is some of the environmental damage that is caused in the building of it. Now, a lot of the factories do build things in a very carbon neutral way. Polestar tried to do that. Tesla do do that, particularly out in Nevada where they've got all those solar panels or did have it. I don't know if the factory's still there. I think it is. I think it's a, what they call it, a gigafactory. But one of the problems is the stuff that goes into making the batteries for electric cars. Now, years ago, back in their early infancy, they used nickel cadmium batteries. Nickel is quite damaging to the environment to mine. And even in the early days of the Prius, they, the untold story was if the nickel would be mined somewhere near Canada, it would then go all the way to Japan to be refined for the Prius to then be shipped back to halfway across the world. So actually, you'd have to do, I think, some of the mass it was well on the way to over a million hyper miles to even get close to offsetting the, the damage. These days, electric cars now use lithium ion batteries, which is very similar to the batteries that you get in a laptop and even uh, uh, companies like Energize and Duracell sell, sell those batteries as well. Lithium ion is very good, you can hold a lot more charge in them. Trenefits are also very heavy, but lithium is also very hard to mine. It causes air pollution. I'm just going to read off an article as to what it was. This is an article on salon.com. This is off salon.com. It's from 2019. Um, I'll put a link in the uh, description. It says, one of the side effects of lithium mining is water pollution. The process of mining can affect local water supplies, potentially poisoning communities. Yet chemical leakage is also a major concern when it comes to lithium mining. The lithium carbonate extraction process harms the soil can call and can cause air pollution. There are also concerns around how to recycle it. Eco non-profit Friends of the Earth notes that lithium recycling is fraught as the metal is toxic, highly reactive and flammable. It tends to be incinerated or ends up in landfill due to very low collection rates and flawed waste legislation. Friends of the Earth states in their lithium tax sheet, low collection rates and low and volatile market price of lithium and the high cost of recycling relative to primary product for primary production have contributed to the absence of lithium recycling. The organisation recommends further social and environmental impact assessments should be made. However, and this is the same point in the same article, then goes on to say, yet, yet the does that mean that electric cars are equally destructive as fossil fuel ones? Certainly not. But the idea that electric cars or anything with lithium batteries are entirely green might not be true. And as demand rises, hidden costs will become more apparent. So once you're driving around in your car, it might be all right. But to actually build it, it's not as ecologically friendly as you might think or you might think you're being, and then when the car comes to the end of its life cycle, if indeed electric cars do come to the end of a life cycle in the same way that traditional fossil fuel ones do, 
then they're going to have a hard potentially have a harder time recycling it. And from reading this article, it explains when I've seen pictures of Teslas going up in flames, it explains why they've gone up in flames to such a degree because it's lithium catching fire. So there are its plus points and its down points. So we've covered what electric can and can't cover, uh, can't cover what the, some of the plus points and down points of electric. Another alternative to electric is fuel cell. So fuel cell is a, basically a hydrogen vehicle or something of that nature. Um, now, plus points, it's a pretty normal method of combusting fuel in the sense, in more traditional sense of is more of a mo more of an engine uh, to it. Um, depending on what you're combusting, most often pe people are combusting hydrogen. Uh, it's no emissions, much like electric, as it, we're not going to get into technicalities of charging electric and so on and so forth. But... Hmm. Broken. It's only putting out water. Which, in many ways, is great. But one of the big problems with hydrogen-powered vehicles is the process of electrolysis that you go through to separate oxygen from the hydrogen atom in water requires a lot of electricity. And actually, you can't offset the car, offset the fuel, quite as well as you can with electric. But, like I said, the cars are more conventional, engine in the front, it's not low down quite as much, and whether you like SUVs or not, and as is well documented, we hate SUVs on Velocity Kinetics, aside from for those where, for instance, blue badge holders require one or people with a disability and so on and so forth. Oh, I should mention the ticking is because I'm sat waiting for Sarah to finish work, and that's my hazard lights. So you're probably going to have an enjoyable soundtrack to this bit of the video. Or something to make you go kill everyone. Who knows? I'm not ready to go kill everyone myself. I'm ready to go to sleep. But, anyway. The advantage of the fuel cell. It can go in just about any vehicle. Because it doesn't really affect the centre of gravity. And you could still pair it with a hybrid system. Granted it still requires a lot of engineering. Uh, to make it happen. But it's possible. Whereas with an electric car. They come across a massive engineering challenge. Of all the weight of the batteries. They try and pack it as low down as possible. But it also means the cars are a little bit higher. So even things like Polestar 2. It's nearly SUV high. Even though it's a it's a traditional saloon or sedan body. But because of all the weight in the bottom. They have to get creative. Whereas like I say. Fuel cell can pack it just about any way you want. You could even Porsche could potentially make a 911 a fuel cell vehicle. If they wanted. Not quite sure I'd want that in a, in a 911 myself. But. It might happen. The other big problem is the infrastructure required. Because hydrogen has to be delivered into the cars at very high pressure, as I've understood it. And you've got to build all those. It's not quite as simple as going to the petrol pump and just pulling it. Glug, glug, glug. And away. And put it back, paying and away you go. The ones I've seen, particularly on Top Gear, I don't know if it's because they were showcase things. Or whether it's because that's the way they have to do it. It's an automatic robotic arm that does that does the ones I've seen. Um, like I said, there there are pros and cons to to the fuel to fuel cell. Fuel cell for me is a good idea, and we need an alternative. We had petrol and diesel. Why can't we have electric and fuel cell? Have a have have the uh, have the battle, and if the fuel cell can be paired with hybrid, then why not? Why not take advantage of reusing the power from, uh, reusing the energy from deceleration? The only real disadvantage, aside from the, the final way that I that I can think of to fuel the cars again, is for the most part, they'll always be teamed to an automatic. Which, if you're a real driver and then like have and like having a clutch and a gearbox. The one time I drove an automatic, I didn't care for it that much. But 
it was a Suzuki Jimny. The engine didn't know what gear it wanted. The, even the dealership said it's the gearbox that I had was not the best suited to the car. So I'd need to try something a bit more refined to see if that changes my mind. But again, certainly those people who has some sort of physical disability that prevents them from being able to use a clutch, or at least automatic makes driving a lot easier for them, it, it, it it's certainly a lot better. Fuel cell... I'll, we'll need to do a bit of digging into fuel cell price, but fuel cell... At least before I've gone and done the digging at this point in this, of the video, I thought fuel cell would have been, give or take, a bit cheaper than a traditional electric. So, back onto the topic of the fuel cell car. The main one that I can find in the UK is the Toyota Mirai. The uh, fuel cell, it's hydrogen, so let's say it's a different way of going about doing the fuel. I am just trying to find a price for the Mirai. Because it's a uh, an interesting looking vehicle to say the least. So we're looking at about 154 horsepower on a on the fuel cell, which is not a uh, bad way of ordering. Not ordering? Why am I talking about ordering? Because I've looked at the ordering page on the brochure. 154 horsepower is what they reckon from the electric motor um, attack that's part of it. So so quite a few different way, quite a good way to go about it. 111 miles an hour top speed, but it's not about top speed. 9.6 seconds to 60, a 342 mile range. It's not, not, not a, a bad set of numbers, and people would feel a lot more at ease using it, or at least I would think people would feel a lot more at ease using it. So, how on earth do we order one, then? I have to resort to Google how to find one. What well, information I can find is about um, the American way of doing it, but I know James May has got one, unless he's had it imported. Because when you go onto Toyota's website and go to New Cars, and then right towards the, in the middle of all of it, when you're looking at your RAV4s and the Highlander and the Supra and the Prius, Tucked away between the Prius and the Land Cruise and Hilux is the Mirai hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. And there's no price next to it. So it must be a way of, or you must have to import it. But it's an interesting looking car, interesting way of going about uh, everything. Actually, I did find out how to order one. You have to contact Toyota directly, and they will contact contact. They will discuss the requirements of the vehicle with you, which is interesting. It'll only be sold in places where there is a refueling network. So, what is the final way forwards to power a car? Synthetic petrol, which I personally think is the way forwards. Why not biofuel? Well. I'm on the fence about biofuel, to be honest. Not as in it's a good or a bad thing, or it's more or less polluting. So I'm just, I know, I'm waiting for Sarah, and I need to make sure that she, I, I don't uh, ignore the fact she's turning up. But bio, the problem with biofuel, there have been a few cases, I think it was Shell that got into trouble for growing fuel, uh, the plants for the fuel. On land that could and should have been used for third world third world countries, and for them to grow food. And until we can feed the world, I don't really think we should be looking at biofuel to quite that extent. So why synthetic? Because we can grow it in a lab. There's a lot, of, or make it in a lab. There's a lot of good good laboratories around. Could probably find something that works in both petrol and diesel. So one pump. And we don't need to get rid of the infrastructure we already have for petrol and diesel. Already got the fuel pumps, etc. All in place. 
and we don't need to get rid of the cars. It could also mean we could engineer it to be more powerful and less polluting. I would say what we could really do with is convergence on the quality of petrol globally. What and uh, what I mean by that is in America, the RON rating on their petrol is lower than what we have in Europe. I say Europe because I still believe in Britain being in Europe, but within Europe and Britain, our quality of petrol is far higher. To put this into perspective, American premium petrol for most pumps is not even the grade of European standard petrol. So when I go to fill up the Beleno tomorrow, I'm putting in 99 RON. American premium is 85. And given that standard petrol in the UK and Europe is 95 RON, again, it's questionable. So if we make it synthetic, we've got to have convergence because we're not engineering one lot of petrol for one part of the world and one part and one for another. But this also means we need to work out. I I know it's very easy and I know Jeremy Clarkson does and I sometimes have in the past and probably have at some point on the blog as well. Oh, that is message from Sarah to say she is here. Okay, we'll pick this up another day but was, uh, uh, later on, but I was just going to finish my point that we that a lot of people make jokes that American petrol is limp wristed and weak. But if if for some reason it works out to be more more fuel efficient, then maybe not. Who knows? So as covered, if we're going to engineer petrol, we need to engineer one that is globally the same. And if it turns out the American petrol is actually more efficient, which I don't think it is because there's less stuff in it to make it explode per cycle of the cylinder, we, it would mean having to change a lot of things. But it is that is what it is. Another advantage to synthetic is we could probably get the cost down faster because the cars are already at the right price. We will have to, I think we, we would need to team them with some form of hybrid, whether that's plug-in or current things like a Toyota Prius style hybrid or just a energy recovery style hybrid, something like that. Any of them... It's going to, on the one hand, put the weight of the car up, but at the same time, if you can replenish the energy you've used whilst driving, then, you know, why not? Especially if you can deploy it later to help you get away from the lights or just start moving or when you're overtaking anything. The problem with electric cars is it's going to take a long time to get the price down. We can also try and keep, in the UK, ignoring what they're proposing to do to the extreme, depending on how who you listen to and how it's reported. But you could keep the tax system the same on UK vehicles. I can't speak about anywhere else in the world, but UK, we've got the tax system for what we have for paying your road tax, so there'd be no exemptions if we use synthetic. The only issue is, is fuel duty tax, which again is its own weird, complicated thing. Um, but it, I think if it went engineered and synthetic, then there is a way to get the cost down faster and potentially put more money back into people's pockets through it. Biofuel does have its, have its place, and it will have its place. But like I said, we've got to feed the world first. F1 is going to biofuel and ethanol. So again, that could be another way forwards instead of a synthetic or engineered petrol. But I don't think, ultimately, having granted through different stages of time, so I started recording this video about three weeks ago, nearly four weeks ago, and you can see just how I've got Christmas decorations up, then I haven't, and certain things, and people who follow uh, Mark Priestley will probably work out when I did one part of that video, because it's, I think it was his last, it might have been his last stream, I think, for the year. Um... Ultimately, electric is not as big of a solution as people think it is. 
And another dirty little secret within all this, regardless of what solution we go for, electric, fuel cell, synthetic, nothing. The ultimate problem is it's only ever going to be as efficient as you drive. So even if you have an electric car, if you throttle down like a madman everywhere, of course you're going to use your juice up. If you throttle down like a madman in a fuel cell car, it's not going to be as efficient. You throttle down like a madman in a petrol or diesel car, of course the fuel goes down. I feel, for the UK at least, ignoring the Brexit gasm that they're currently having over everything and what happens with trade and fuel prices etc etc ultimately it's a very short-sighted view and we come back around to that issue of cost for the electric vehicles and i can only assume that toyota arai mirai sorry not arai mirai must cost north of thirty thousand pounds which for someone on an average salary is a long way out of possibility to be purchased it's not obtainable or at least if you want to have a second car like a lot of families need it's not attainable heck sarah and i the other day were doing some maths and trying to work out how we could afford something like a ford mondeo a state stroke subaru Levorg, something of that sort of size and afford to keep a suzuki baleno ford focus suzuki swift sized vehicle as well that's pretty much what what we'd what we'd want and they're not breaking the bank, those cars, not by any stretch of the imagination. But given how not cheap to run, not cheap to purchase, and not cheap to tax and insure, petrol and conventional diesel cars are, what in the fuck is fuel cell and electric going to do? This is why I think ultimately synthetic is the way to go. Because I think it's the only way people are going to be able to afford to keep going to work. As it is in the previous video about car tax. Some of us are potentially going to find ourselves in a position soon of having to pay to go to work more than we already do. We'll see what happens. 2020 has been a very, very funny year for all this sort of thing. And we're finishing recording this in 2021. Um, and before you ask why the hat whilst I'm in a hat indoors, combination of this house is actually very cold at the moment and also I badly need a haircut and it's a mess. So anyway, so we'll have to see what happens. Personally, my opinion is synthetic is the way to go. My friend Mikey thinks fuel cell, my brother thinks electric. There isn't a right or wrong opinion. On it but there's a very right or wrong and wrong way to go about executing the uh, the change so we and um, we'll end it there because this video is already extremely long uh, compared to a lot of our recent ones so thank you for taking the time to watch this uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel please like the Facebook page please donate via paypal.me forward slash velocity kinetics uh, coming up in 2021, we've got some new video content. As you might be able to tell, I've got some new hardware. So I'm trying to work on getting the audio a bit more constant. It's not the most expensive. Well, I hope it's not the most expensive lapel mic. But hopefully it can make things a bit better on the sound front. And I um, hope everyone had a good, as good of a Christmas as it can be. Uh, if you're in Tier 4, stay the fuck indoors. As someone who works in a Tier 4 area where people have recently not been staying in like they should just just don't just don't go out stay indoors if you if you really must go out make sure it's just to go to get your food shop or to walk the dog or the children um we will do a video shortly uh reviewing 2020 because oddly reviewing the 2019 our review of 2019 velocity kinetic for velocity kinetic got quite a few views so we'll do another one of those shortly. And um, until next time, drive safe, look after yourselves. Hope this new year is prosperous and fortuitous. And I hope this new year brings about prog more progression for Velocity Kinetics. And hopefully some interesting new content.